um, get started. Hello, everyone, and um, welcome to the last AMD seminar for this academic year. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, Dirk Bergaman. As you can see, we are going to end the year in a, a high note. Um, Dirk is a uh, Douglas and uh, Marion Campbell Professor of Economics at Yale University. He has secondary appointments as Professor of Computer Science at the School of Engineering and Professor of Finance at the School of Management. Um, Dirk serves as a co-editor of the American Economic uh, Review Insights and uh, is a member of the Executive Committee of the Economic, Econometric Society. He's a fellow of the uh, Econometric Society and the American Academy of uh, Arts, and Science, Arts and Sciences. Uh, he is the recipient of the Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellowship, Google Faculty Fellowship, and an Amazon Scholar. His research has been supported by grants from the uh, NSF, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, Omidyar Network, Network, Knight Foundation, and the German, German National Science Foundation. Um, so I'm going to leave the floor to Dirk in a second. A quick reminder uh, for the audience before I do that. Um, if you have any questions, please raise your hand, and we are going to uh, allow you to ask your questions directly, uh, directly at our speaker. You can alternatively utilize the chat and we will uh, relay the uh, questions directly to uh, Dirk. Um, Dirk, it's a real pleasure to have you here with us today. We look forward to your talk. Thanks for joining us. Great. Um, thank you, Ozan, and thank you, Vahidi. Um, this was an excellent occasion for us to, to put a little bit speed on developing this paper. So um, having said that, um, let me use this as an excuse that I, in the moment, I can't give you a, a full draft yet. And uh, so, so that you will um, have to uh, work with the slides and also uh, there might be some imprecisions here and there, but, uh, but uh, um, we made, I think, good progress. And so I'm, I'm very happy to tell you about this. This is joint work with Thibaut Heumann, who is at the uh, Catholic University in Chile, uh, and Stephen Morris, who's at MIT. The title of the paper is Selling Impressions efficiency versus market sickness and um, this paper um, is really quite literally about uh, selling impressions uh, in the world of digital advertising. In the world of digital advertising private information between the uh, bidders and, and the sellers takes a particularly rich and uh, an interesting distributed form. So if you think about uh, an auction for either a search query or for an impression and display advertising, then uh, the object of the auction is really the viewer uh, who has many attributes, you know, think about his demographics, past browsing behavior, past purchase behavior, and so on. And the publisher or uh, an auction platform acting on behalf of the publisher uh, as the seller uh, giving access to the viewer has private information typically about the attributes of the viewer. In turn, the advertisers who's going to try to reach the bidder as a bidder is trying to reach the viewer has of course private information about his preferences that is his willingness to pay for the attributes of the viewer. Some viewers might be more interesting uh, for a particular otherwise than others. The value of the match, or in fact, the impression when it's being, when the match is being realized between the advertiser and the viewer is jointly determined. And so that is what we mean by this distributed form is jointly determined by these different sources of private information. The attributes of the viewer on the one hand side and the preference of the advertisers for these attributes on the other hand. The question that we want to ask in this paper, what is the optimal way for the seller, that is the publisher, to reveal information about the quality of the match, in particular, to reveal information about the attributes of the viewer, so as to enhance uh, the revenue of the auction? Okay. The, the, the main results that we're going to derive and focus on is uh, focusing squarely on this trade-off uh, between efficiency of the match on the one hand side and the level of competition or market sickness, as some people have called it, on the other hand. The seller, so the publisher, uh, faces really a classic economic trade-off. He can provide more information about the attributes of the viewers, um, and that typically will improve the quality of the match, and thus the social surplus. Uh, but it also implies that there will typically be uh, thinner markets, there will be less competition, because with all of this information available, there might be one uh, and not many bidders who has a particularly high value for this viewer. 
the the main result that I'm going to present to you today is to give you uh, a full description of what the optimal information design um, of the auction is. Okay, and what we're going to show that it will be optimal to fully reveal the quality of low value matches. Those are the matches where probabilistically speaking competition will be high and intense but pool the value of the premium matches, that is the high value matches, because that is where competition, probabilistically speaking, will be low. Okay. Today we will focus on digital advertising. So we will take as given um, that we will be running a second price auction. And in fact, a second price auction without any further bells and whistles. And what we are mainly interested in is how we bring the information together. So that will be um, a question of incentive constraints and how we will then turn this information into uh, more competition uh, and uh, more revenue. That is how we can use information design to steer and control revenue absent any other tools that we would typically use uh, in the world of auctions. Okay. The language that I'm going to use today um, and the main uh, application that we have today in mind and that um, will be reflected in talk really focuses on digital advertising. But I hope that as I go through it, uh, what you will realize is that the model and some of the results um, has in fact many applications. So if you think about viewers, bundling viewers or unbundling viewers, then this is really quite similar to thinking about bundling assets or bundling financial claims. So, so you can think about this and we will um, we'll have result on that. Um, uh, think about this as basically asset design or the, the building of claims as an information design problem when we want to offer one asset or many assets for sale but um, this is just sort of a perspective that i want to offer to you today we will focus um, on digital advertising okay i want to emphasize that we want to think um, of this as a world where the viewers are typically heterogeneous in many dimensions so the attributes uh, are going to be typically high dimensional and if you wish very high dimensional and likewise, the advertisers will show a, a corresponding degree of heterogeneity in their willingness to pay for a match. So this is um, a world where we have many different pieces of information, some of this, uh, some of which we want to use, others we don't. Okay. Our way of thinking uh, about this problem is to basically uh, bring together the elicitation of the preferences, the elicitation of the information, um into the auction okay so um it is the object or it is uh the the objective of the seller to basically join the information of the advertisers and the publishers bring it together create information and then translate this information uh, in bits for the viewer and for the match okay today we're going to consider uh two schemes or if you wish two algorithms of how uh, once we form the information, we're going to think about the bid formation. One is uh, what we call automated bidding. That is, um, once the information is elicited and is generated, then it will be automatically translated into a bid. Um, and at that point, it's out of the hand of the advertisers. So the advertisers face just a single incentive concern, namely to reveal their information truthfully. In manual bidding, uh, the advertisers will have a chance to take the information as it's being generated and then turn it into a bid. So that will be a setting where besides truth telling, we will have an additional set of constraints, which we will um, call obedience constraints. Uh, both of these constraints, uh, both of these uh, algorithms, a way of bringing information into the bidding process are used. Um, you may say that there's sort of over time a move towards automated bidding. Uh, and you can imagine in a world of digital advertising where we have very high dimensional informations, where we need to degenerate uh, these bids very, very fast, there's a drive from manual bidding to, to automated bidding. Okay, so the, the picture that I give you here is just um, 
a high level description of for example how uh, in google ad campaigns the uh, bidders that is the advertisers can choose to describe their preferences about uses of devices location the scheduling of the ads uh, the interactions the demographics and so on okay okay and so um with this um brief introduction i'm i'm ready and um prepared to to give you the model um I trust Ozan and Valdi that you will uh, let me know if there are urgent questions that you know might be helpful for the understanding of everybody. So, so the model um, will start out with the primitives, and those are the attributes and the preference of the attributes. Um, we're going to choose um, um, a fairly high-dimensional but symmetric environment uh, that we will work with. So we think about there being n advertisers who bid for a viewer in a second price auction. The primitives are the attributes of each viewer. And we think about them just as binary attributes, either minus one or plus one. There can be many of them indexed by J. Each advertiser has preferences for these attributes, also expressed in, in terms of binary variables. And so we refer to the attributes and the preferences as the characteristics of the model. An impression is a match between advertiser and viewer. And we think about the match quality between advertiser and viewer simply as the product of these binary values. So if if they align, if they have plus one and plus one on both sides, that generates a positive increment. If they don't align, that generates a negative increment. Okay, the total number of successful matches is basically the number of aligned matches versus the number of misaligned matches. That's the number uh, that we're tracking and we're normalizing it uh, by the square root of the number of characteristics as we are going to be particularly interested in the case when there's a large number of attributes, okay? That is just the raw description of the matches, okay? And uh, we're going to then transform the quality of the match, that is just the single number mi, into a value uh, for the advertiser, that is simply an increasing function of the number of realized matches. Okay, so if um, we were to know the realization of the attributes, and if we were to know the preferences, then we would know what the willingness of the advertiser would be for any particular viewer. Okay. So this is a high dimensional models in terms of attributes and preferences. But of course, we're interested ultimately in uh, the willingness to pay of the advertiser for the viewer. And the valuation function basically uh, performs this um, scaling of the match quality into a willingness to pay. Yes. OK, so just to complete the description, um, of the stochastic environment, we think about these attributes um, as being independently and uniformly distributed. And so if you were in a position to observe the attributes and were in a position to observe the preferences, then the realization of um, these characteristics would in turn give us or would induce a distribution of values for the advertisers. Okay. So um, this big formula here is just basically the binomial formula. But what I want you to take away from this is that basically this model of attributes and characteristics generates a distribution of values if we were to um, completely reveal all of the information. The, the question of the information design that we're going to face is, will it be optimal to reveal uh, the attributes? Okay, that is, do I have an incentive to reveal the attributes and the preferences? And do I want to maybe sometimes bundle them or hide them to compress or um, otherwise manage the underlying distribution of valuations, capital F? Yes? Question, uh, Dirk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the um, uniformity assumption in the previous slide, we assume both X's and Y's are uniform. Um, are we going to 
exploit symmetry somehow going forward? Is that um, we're going to use the symmetry? Uh, so um, I don't believe either one of these uh, properties is critical, but we're going to use the symmetry uh, later on when we focus on the incentive constraints that will allow us to um, reduce the dimensionality of the incentive constraints substantially. Okay. Okay. Uh, but this is a nice question because what I want to emphasize is that even though um, we think about the underlying attributes and preferences as independent and uniformly distributed. Um, since we have the transformation of the match quality in utilities, uh, essentially this model is rich enough to generate any arbitrary distribution in terms of the willingness to pay. So this model, even though it looks highly stylized, basically is rich enough to give us any arbitrary distribution in terms of the underlying willingness and the underlying value. So it basically is rich enough to generate, to give us a general model of, uh, in, of um, independent private values of the bidders if we were to reveal all of the information. Um, thank you. And in the meantime, I think there are a couple other questions. Uh, uh, Vitor, you can unmute yourself and ask. And then uh, there's another question in the chat that I wanted to rely after afterwards. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, hello, Dirk. It's nice to uh, see you. It's very uh, nice to see you, Vitor. Mm -hmm. I just have a quick question, trying to understand uh, still the importance of this uniform assumption. It seems that somehow it limits the amount of correlation of values across builders. I'm just wondering like how yes. much of that it's doing. So that's an, uh, so that's an excellent observation. Um, the independence um, of the, uh, the independence of attributes and preferences is basically uh, leading to uh, an independent private value world in terms of the assumption that is, even if I know my preferences as a bidder, since the attributes are symmetrically independently distributed, knowing my preferences doesn't give me any additional information about the willingness to pay um, of the other bidders. Um, so the model that we're generating here is one really of horizontal differentiation, okay? If we had some correlation, uh, then we were to get into models of vertical differentiation, which could be interesting, but would then lead um, to also correlation in the values. And so then we would have um, a slightly different and more involved auction model. So we want to start with this model that returns to us in the base case, the classic model of independent private values. Okay, but it seems that the work of, uh, is being done by the uniform and sim in independence of the Ys. The mm -hmm. Xs don't seem to be too important to generate this. That's independence, correct. Right? Or... Yep. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Great. Other question from the audience, uh, Dirk. Uh, yep. Why match quality doesn't depend on number of viewers with a particular attribute? Sorry, <laughs> say that again. I didn't quite get that question. Uh, why does the match quality uh, not depend on the number of viewers with a particular attribute? Uh, I... on, on the number of viewers? Yeah. Um, we can also take this question at the end of the talk where the... Yes, uh, yeah. so, oh, so yeah. this was just to say, you know, for any particular viewer, uh, this is generating value. And then, of course, we can think about a, a particular viewer being a representative viewer. Good. So let me just emphasize that a particular interesting case for us is a limiting case when J goes to infinity, then because of the independence and the uniformity in the distribution, MI gives us a standard normal distribution in terms of the match quality. Um, and by choosing U appropriately, we can basically get any uh, you know, any arbitrary absolutely continuous distribution F over values for any single bidder. And by the independence um, gives us a symmetric distribution among binders uh, as well. Okay. Uh, in terms of the information design, we want to think about the publisher uh, of choosing the information structure that basically takes as input, the attributes and the preferences, and then generates a signal, okay? Because of this projection from the match quality into uh, the value, we can I, equivalently think about this mapping or the information structure just as a mapping from value into signal. 
And what this signal then does is it will generate a posterior expectation for every bidder that allows every bidder, that is every advertiser, conditional on his own preferences and conditional on the signals that he get to estimate what the value of the object is. Okay. In automated bidding, we want to think about the advertiser submitting his preferences, uh, that is his vector y. We want to guarantee uh, that in the auction that is done subject to the truth-telling constraints. And then the publisher uh, complements the advertiser's preference with attribute information, okay? That is the signal. And given the signal, the publisher commits himself to submit a bid uh, that is the optimal bit from the point of view of the bidder. And since we are working in a second price auction, that is simply be the uh, expectation that the bidder has about his value, given the signal, given his own preferences. Okay. Um, in manual bidding, which we're going to uh, think about, we basically have to augment uh, the incentive concerns by the bidder. We are concerned about truth telling, that is reporting the preferences to the publishers. Um, but then uh, the, pub, the advertisers gets a chance to take the information that the publisher generated for him, telling him this might be somebody you are interested in, uh, into a bid. And so uh, in order to guarantee that the behavior of the advertiser follows uh, the incentive consent, we would now have to guarantee both truth setting and obedience. This is basically um, now we have two sets of incentive consents or double deviations that we need to be concerned with. Okay. In the talk, I'm going to focus first on the information design and then return towards the end um, of how we're going to satisfy and whether we're able to satisfy the incentive constraints. Um, a quick um, anticipation of that result is to say that under automated bidding, we're going to get truth telling guaranteed uh, always and for any arbitrary model of attributes and bidders. Uh, manual bidding is going to be a little bit harder, but we're going to be able to give a, a mechanism that in fact approximates the optimal mechanism and satisfies exactly both truth telling and obedience constraints. So under either case, whether we have automated bidding or whether we have manual bidding, the optimal information structure um, or an approximation of the optimal information structure can satisfy the incentive constraints. We do this at the very end rather than the beginning as you would have perhaps anticipated in classic mechanism design because the task of fully describing uh, all incentive compatible mechanism in this high dimensional world is one that we don't know how to do. But what we do know how to do is to verify whether the optimal mechanism that we derive satisfies the incentive constraints. So therefore we have in some sense, a more limited results regarding the incentive constraint relative to standard mechanism design, but it's sufficiently strong uh, for us to carry through with the analysis here uh, with respect to the information set. Okay. Okay, and so uh, the objective of the seller, as I said, is really just to maximize the revenue in the second price auction. The revenue is simply the second highest expected valuation. And so the objective of the seller is really uh, to find that information structure um, subject to the incentive constraints that maximizes the expectation of the second order statistic, not necessarily of the true valuation, but of the posterior expectations. Okay. Um, great. And, and with this, um, I think I'm ready to jump uh, into the analysis. Yeah. Um, I'm happy also to take questions uh, regarding setup, but we had a few already. Ah, let me perhaps just um, quickly mention, um, you know, there's some work on, on how to think about um, information design in auction. There's an early paper by Ganusa. There's a, an earlier paper uh, with Martin Pessendorfer. The notion of conflation actually by Levin and Milgram that they 
suggested was sort of motivating for our analysis here, and you will see it appear. Uh, but it's a different it's a different object that we're handling than um, those that they discussed. The issue of you know automated versus manual bidding, the issue of bringing information or bidding information into a mechanism is actually one uh, that has recently gotten quite some attention, mostly in the theoretical computer science literature. So for example, Jason Hartline talks about dashboard mechanisms. Um, the big difference here is they're using uh, algorithms or you know dashboard mechanisms in some sense to be able to handle indirect mechanism where there's no true telling equilibrium by the bidders. So that is because they want to use first price or, or pay auction or the objective function of the advertiser is non-traditional. Here we're doing something um, entirely different. We are thinking about how to bring information and in particular additional augmented information into the bidding process. And that's why we want to use um, something like a um, an automated bidding algorithm. Okay. So, so can I ask um, one clarifying yeah. question? So, uh, uh, does the number of bidder uh, come to play at some point? Because uh, one side of this uh, trade-off is uh, competition, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not just about information; it's also important how many mm -hmm. bidders we have. Yep. Um, well, it comes to play not in the sense that we're going to make a statement about the computational complexity or something that the, you might suggest. It comes to play in the sense that. Um, the optimal form of the mechanism is going to be influenced quite strongly by how competitive that market is. Uh, it's a very important question, of course, in digital advertising, because there we will typically think about uh, a large number of possible bidders um, being available. And in fact, that will allow us to sharpen some of the insights and some of the results. So, so we'll, we'll come back to that. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Great. Okay. So um, we're starting with the analysis. I want to start out um, with the information design part. So I, I, I'm going to abstract away for the moment from the incentive constraint and basically going to start thinking about how can we identify the optimal information structure, okay? For every bidder, um, we said that his value is going to be generated by his own private information and by the information that the publisher provides to him, okay? So in a sense, the publisher is under um, the question of how should he uh, supply information in order to influence the distribution of the posterior expectation. Okay, we're going to look uh, at a symmetric solution. And, and so really, therefore, since we're going to look at a second price auction, what is key is simply the second order statistic of um, the distribution of the posterior expectation that are going to be uh, generated by this additional information. Okay, so so let's call that second order. Uh, let's call the distribution of a posterior expectation G in contrast to F, which is the underlying valuation, uh, and let's call the second order statistic W two. Uh, and really, the expected revenue of your auctioneer is nothing else but uh, the expected value of the second order statistic. That's the object that we're interested in maximizing. And of course, uh, that has to happen subject to the set of feasible distribution G, namely how much can we deform the underlying distribution F to still have a, a representation, a base plausible representation of the values, okay? Uh, Blackwell and Gershik, of course, tell us uh, how to do that. Namely, uh, a signal introduces a distribution of the expected valuation if and only if uh, F is a mean preserving spread of G. Okay. So, in other words, if we start out with the original distribution, then information provision can be as most as uh, fine as the original values, but it can compress information. And so therefore F has to be a mean preserving spread of G. Okay. A characterization of a mean preserving spread is simply given by these two uh, inequalities. And when we write uh, the relationship, then we say F is a mean preserving spread of G whenever F is 
script smaller than G. Yes. So uh, with this, uh, really, we um, have identified our optimization problem and are almost at the end of the talk. No, not quite, okay? Um, because if you look now at the objective function, which is simply to say we want to choose a distribution G so that we maximize uh, the revenues that we can get from the second order statistic, and we want to choose G so that it F is a mean preserving spread of G, what we see is that this objective function is of course highly nonlinear in the optimization variable, which is G. Okay. Um, and in fact, um, if you look at this integral, it's neither a convex nor a concave program. So it's, it's clearly not uh, linear, but it has uh, not a very nice structure um, in terms of convexity or concavity. So, so we have to work a little harder uh, and, and possibly rewrite it so that we can get to a, a more um, accessible format. Okay. And the way we're going to do it is uh, instead of writing it in terms of a distribution of values, we're going to write it in terms of the quantiles of the second order statistic. Okay, so, right? So a quantile um, of a given a random variable is always uniformly distributed. Okay. Here, we're not interested in the quantile of an arbitrary a random variable, in particular of the random variable, which gives the values, but we're interested in the quantile of the second highest valuation, okay? Or the distribution function of the quantile of the second highest valuation, okay? That is a function that I display you in the middle here as capital S of Q, okay? This function has actually a, a few nice properties, but foremost among them is that once we write the second order statistic in terms of the quantile, it is actually independent of, of the underlying distribution f and g. Okay, and that's just as the quantile of a random variable, so is the quantile of the second order statistic independent uh, of the underlying variable and just depends on the quantile and the number of draws we're taking, namely capital N. Okay, so we're going to rewrite the objective function, okay? And now using um, not the value, but rather the quantile and using as measure for the maximization problem, uh, simply the second or the, the quantile distribution of the second order statistic, okay? Now we're of course maximizing over different object. We're not maximizing over the value. We are maximizing over the quantile distribution G. Okay. But fortunately, there's a nice relationship between the ordering of F and G in terms of mean preserving spread and the ordering of their quantiles in terms of mean preserving spread. That ordering is simply reversed. Okay. Okay. So now we have a description of the maximization problem in terms not of the variable, but in terms of the quantile. Okay. But now that objective function is in fact linear in the quantile. Okay. And we still have the same description in terms of mean preserving spread, except that we now look not at the upper contour set, but at the lower contour set. Right? That's a problem that's accessible to us. And as an implication of this, we can give a complete analysis of um, the optimal information structure. Okay, so, so that was the main result that I highlighted into introduction. Let me give it to you now before I then uh, try to give you a little bit of hint at the geometry of the problem. Okay, so uh, supposing that F is absolutely continuous, then the unique optimal symmetric information structure is given by a signal that gives each bidder his true value, that is completely discloses the value. If that value in terms of the quantile falls below a certain threshold Q star. By contrast, if that threshold is exceeded at that value, then all we are telling the bidder is that his value is high and therefore his expectation is such that 
in terms of the posterior expectation is such that it bundles all values that are above the Q star quantile. Okay. The interesting uh, aspect of this result is that the determination of the Q star will depend on the number of bidders, as you might imagine, on the level of competition that is in the market. But it's independent of the underlying distribution of values. Okay, And so what this is saying, uh, what Q star is really controlling is the thickness of the market. And if the market's becoming is not thick enough, that is if the probability that a competitor is, in particular, somebody who provides a second highest bid is small enough, then we're going to bundle that information. Okay. And so it's really uh, creating, in some sense, a uniform thickness in the market that is independent of the distribution of values and just can be expressed in terms of simply of having the probability of there being a strong competitor. Um, really good question, Dirk. Um, I actually have asked this earlier. Um, the uh, signals are always mappings from uh, an agent's own reports. Uh, you know, to, 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 the to the message, or could it be a function of the vector of um, agents' reports? So I see. So yes, exactly. So um, earlier on, I specified the information structure is one that takes in only the information of each advertiser separately and then makes a bid recommendation to him. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and uh, and about... you're right. So if we could... Um, you know, correlate the bits, uh, we might get a, we might have much more power in terms of extracting the, the surplus. Um, we think of the independence as important in our digital advertising setting, because often uh, the bits are going to come to different, um, you know, platforms or different uh, managing agents of the publishers. And so therefore, um, the information that's being provided to one bidder who's coming from one network and another bidder who's coming from another worker can't necessarily be correlated and the independence is just a, a restatement of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so... Um, so, so we are looking here um, at a setting with n bidders, okay? And so, so it's it's a multi-agent information design problem. We're looking uh, at the symmetric solution. We can show um, that for a small number of bidders, we know that the symmetric solution is in fact the uniquely optimal one. We haven't been able to push the argument um, inductively uh, to to very large end. So, so I think we can't even really stop at five. I'm, I'm not quite sure. We're missing. We must be missing some insight. In any case, um, I think the semantic solution is is quite interesting, um, and it's basically uh, is one that reveals all of the information for the low value bidders, uh, but for the high value bidders, it basically bundles them. Uh, that means that the information rent for the winning uh, bidder is going to be depressed relative to the complete information setting. Okay, and it's uh, precisely that depressed information rent that is coming or that generating gain in the revenue for the seller. And he's willing to give up some amount of efficiency because, of course, if he's bundling, he cannot guarantee himself to give the object to the person who really has the highest value. But he's willing to give up uh, the, a little bit of efficiency uh, in order to increase the revenue by depressing the information. Okay. Uh, in terms of... Um, the story of attributes and characteristics, this has, of course, a nice implementation because we're basically saying um, we're going to tell every bidder how many matched attributes he has until he comes to a certain threshold. And then we're simply going to say, uh, this is a very good match for you. You have more than N star matches, but we are not telling you exactly uh, how many matches are being uh, succeeded. So. Um, the open question for us is, of course, what determines the quantile Q star? And, and perhaps I can um, just quickly um, get go you sort of to the graph and, and see you where the role of the second, uh, second order statistic comes in. Okay, so uh, let me immediately start with the second order statistic in terms of 
defined in terms of the quantile. Okay, here I'm drawing a picture for uh, three bidders. Okay, we can prove that this has a unique inflection point. Okay, that is, it changes from convexity to concavity always exactly once, and that's true for every n. Okay, and so. Um, because we were rewriting the problem in terms of the uh, value distribution and the quantiles, and we were rearranging the order between mean preserving spread, here we have a problem not of concavification, but of convexification. So what we're trying to do is to find the largest convex function that sits below uh, the objective we are having. Okay? And so uh, whenever the original function is convex, then of course we're happy, where it's concave, we basically need to create mass point just uh, as in the classic examples of Bayesian persuasion. But observe that we're going to do all of this uh, with respect to the distribution of the second order quantiles, okay, a second order statistic quantile. So um, we now have to basically think about okay so 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 you see here already that we have from the uh, quantile basically a condition of uh, where the matching point has to be that is when we depart from the convex function and we create the hull okay and when we then translate it into the values okay so um, then we must translate it back from the quantile distribution to the values of the individual bidders. So what I'm mapping you here is just now not the quantile distribution of the second order statistic, but the quantile distribution of a bidder i, okay? When the underlying distribution is uh, simply the root distribution, right? So capital F of V is simply the root of V on zero and one, okay? Um, we had the mass point being created in the quantile of the second order statistic. They now in turn create mass points or jumps in the distribution of the quantile of the individual distribution. Okay. And to return from the quantile to the original distribution of the values, because that is, after all, the object for which we're going to try to identify the information structure. We simply have to rotate, switch the axis from Q to V, from V to Q. Okay. And that's what you get here. Okay. And so uh, what we have here now is um, the distribution of V in blue. That's the original distribution that we started. This is the um, the root distribution and the information structure that supports um, the optimal information structure is the red one. And as you see, it has um, exactly one jump being created from the quantile distribution. But what this simply means is that we are now going to have a bundle on the uh, upper part of the distribution and on the lower part of the distribution, the red dashed line and the blue line follow each other. That is here we have complete information revelation. Okay. So, so the quantile um, allows us to basically turn this into a linear program. Okay. And basically allows us also then uh, to give a, an implicit description of what the optimal quantile Q star is. Mm -hmm. One can show that that quantile is increasing in N, meaning the more bidders we have, the less we need to rely on information to create competition because we already have competition. Okay, And as N goes towards infinity, uh, in fact, uh, eventually we're going to Q equal to one. That is mean we have vanishing amounts of bundling in the information structure. Okay. Um, Q is equal to zero if N is equal to two. So if we're just using a second order, a second uh, price auction, then the best thing uh, with very few bidders is not to provide any information and simply um, allocate the object at random and um, actually uh, some of the um, auctions uh, that are currently being run on search and display advertising actually have a, uh, some kind of randomization in, in build that basically mimics this. So this is um, okay, good. 
um, to verify the optimality of the suggested information structure, um, we can actually use a very nice result in recent work of Philip, uh, Andreas, and Benny um, that thinks about uh, extreme points of monotone functions with many applications. Uh, the application that the result that's interesting for us here is the one where the objective function um, is linear. Okay. Now notice that this is a decision problem. Um, with um, the second price auction, we have a, uh, an ability to basically think about a higher dimensional, that is a strategic environment, an auction environment, uh, and reduce it to a smaller one player in some sense or decision maker problem uh, that allows us to uh, use some of their results. All right. Um, I'm running a little bit out of time, so let me give you um, sort of two uh, one application to large market, as I have promised you, and then um, talk a little bit about incentive compatibility and what's at stake here. Okay. Um, so, so large market um, is arguably, you know, at least large market in terms of a, a possible set of bidders is probably sort of the right thing to think about in digital advertising because for any viewer um, there might be um, just a, a large number of possible advertisers that may want to uh, wish to advertise their product but of course uh, given the attributes uh, some are maybe less or more interested okay and so, so what we're interested in is thinking about what happens with the optimal information structure when the number of participating bidders becomes large. Okay. Uh, we'll do this um, for two set of uh, different conditions or environments. Um, the first one uh, is about random number of bidders in the sense that with probability P, an advertiser may not be interested in the particular viewer. And so then his valuation is zero, but with probably one minus P, um, he has indeed interest and the value is distributed there. Okay. We are interested in taking the limit as the number of possible bidders becomes large, but the number of interested bidder uh, stays constant. And so that means that both n as well as p is going to infinity or one. Okay. What we want to keep as constant is lambda, which is just the product of the number of possible bidders times those, the probability of those that are uh, really interested in that particular view. Okay. Remember, we computed earlier on the optimal quantile Q star. Okay. And, and so you can think about rho as uh, the number of expected bidders given the critical quantile Q star. As n goes to infinity, this takes on a, a nice um, you know, quadratic exponential equation that one can solve numerically, but that gives us a critical threshold value of rho in terms of the expected number of bidders that are necessary. Okay? The result that we're then getting in terms of the optimal information structure is sort of interesting. If the expected number of bidders, okay, of interested bidders, I should say, is smaller than that critical threshold row, then the optimal information structure is actually bundling all of the interested bidders with those that are with some of them that are not interested at a particular rate. So that the information we're going to give them is to say, you, this is not for you, you shouldn't bid, or this is for you, possibly for you, and you should bid. Okay. If on the other hand, lambda is large and exceeds a threshold row, then we're going to discard the uninterested bidder uh, and simply perform uh, the same exercise as we did in the absence of the uninterested bidder. But the sort of the striking thing here is that if there are few interested bidders, so think about this as sort of the relevant example for long tail viewers where only few advertisers are interested, then what we're going to do is actually bundle zero values with positive values. And we're going to do that to basically increase the number of participants in the auction, even though it lowers the value of the object from something positive to something closer to zero. That's a little bit of a practice um, that is debated in, in the world of display advertising, because of course it means that um, you're creating sort of a false sense of positive matches sometimes referred to as broad search, where we basically 
um, showing an advertiser's viewers that he really might not be interested, but there, there's a rationale behind it, and that's simply uh, creating competition in the marketplace. Um, another way to, to think about that issue is one that uh, Anosti, Beck, and Milgram suggested in an earlier work where they said, well, um, really, we want to think about digital advertising as a world where uh, we have heavy tails. So there are few people uh, with very large values and for specific viewers. Okay. The Pareto distribution is, of course, one example. The results that I can give you here um, are much broader and, and so basically true whenever the distribution has regular varying tails. Okay. The exercise I want to perform here is to say, um, let the number of bidders become large. Okay. Um, are there going to be gains still had from the information design? Okay. And so what we're going to do is to say, let's compute what the ratio is between what we would get if we would completely disclose all of the information. So we were abandoned information design. Okay. That's simply the expected value of the second highest value. Let's compare it to what we're going to do under the optimal information structure. So while it's true that in the earlier result, we said that Q goes equal to one, it didn't say at which speed it's going. In particular, with heavy tails, we're always going to pick up enough value that actually uh, the optimal auction that uses information design is going to generate a sustainable gain relative to the complete information auction even as n goes to infinity. So the ratio between the optimal auction that uses information design and the complete disclosure uh, that's just running the second price auction is going to be z, uh, where z is a constant that is larger than one. Okay, And uh, when it's particularly heavy tail, then the z can uh, get, of course, very large. OK. Um, so, so these are two results um, about the significance uh, of information design, even in a world where we have many bidders, and therefore one might have thought that competition just by itself would completely solve the problem. And, and the answers um, that would understate that the power of, um, of influencing information or influencing bidding behavior through information. Okay. Um, so that's just the summary of the statement. So the, the, um, the last part. Um, uh, and for us, sort of the, the most open part and interesting part is to think about incentive constraints. So in the language of uh, Meyerson, um, I, I'm always not quite sure whether I, I like it or not, but it's honesty and obedience. That is, um, there is truth telling by the advertisers about their preferences, and there's obedience by the advertisers, namely whether they are willing to follow the bid recommendation that is coming from the algorithm. Okay. Uh, and indeed, here it is where we are going to use the symmetry. Okay, so so we're now thinking about um, bidders, not by assumption reporting truthfully, but we want to investigate whether they have the right incentives to report truthfully when uh, the information is being generated according to the optimal information design, and the bids are then being generated by the rules, um, as explained earlier. I failed to to pause in case there were questions, but you didn't interrupt me, so I, I took it as, as implicit permission to go ahead. Okay, so let me use that freedom for another five minutes and then then I open it. Okay, so uh, there's a reporting strategy for bidder I that's simply mapping his um, preferences into a report that can be truthfully or not, and uh, so. Squiggle will always uh, distinguish report uh, from non-squiggle, which is this true value. Okay, so so if we had misreported, we would of course generate uh, a different value. Okay, and we would then report about the different values. Since preferences and attributes are symmetrically are symmetrically distributed. From our point of view, a sufficient statistic for the bidder strategy is simply a function of the preference, a fraction of the preference reported truthfully. Okay, so I read a report plus one or minus one. If I report truthfully, I'm going to get the positive sign. If I'm reporting uh, non truthfully, I get a negative sign. So TI is simply going to be the fraction of truthfully reported signs. Okay. 
So since we now normalizing for simplicity, not by uh, square root of j by j, uh, this means that basically ti uh, can vary from minus one to plus one. Plus one means everything is reported truthfully, minus one is nothing reported truthfully, okay? Um, again, symmetry um, means that basically it will be sufficient for us to track just a fraction um, of truthfully reported values. And by the exchangeability, uh, it means that any fraction will lead to the same distribution um, of exterior um, of posterior values. Okay. Um, here is the lemma that's going to be important for um, automated bidding, but even more important uh, for manual bidding. And that says, um, so take the optimal information structure. That's the, um, the restriction here. That is, we're not doing this for any arbitrary information structure, okay? Um, if I take any T other than one, then the generated signal is less informative for the bidder that he's getting and then reporting truthfully, okay? Uh, that's on the positive part of the unit interval. And something like this is also true on the negative part, okay? Uh, if I'm going to misreport, then everything uh, that is not exactly misreporting in the opposite direction is going to be less informative. And so what this lemma in some sense gives us is the result uh, that the critical incentive constraint is either reporting truthfully or misreporting everything. Everything in between is dominated. And as long as we can guarantee uh, that I don't want to reverse my preferences, I'm in excellent shape, okay? Uh, with this lemma, we can then establish that under auto bidding and in the optimal information structure, it's a dominant strategy for the advertiser to report his preferences truthfully. So, um, the assumption that we're going to elicit the preferences and then use that in the information generation is without loss of generality under auto bidding. And it, it basically means we only have to respect uh, the honesty constraints. Okay. It's still true that we need um, the optimal information structure. It's not going to be true under all information structure. Uh, but by means of a counterexample, which I don't have time, um, we can also show that truth telling is not an equilibrium in manual bidding for every N and every U. Okay. But we can suggest an information structure that depresses the incentive to misrepresent. And as we get many bidders, is doing as well as the optimal information structure. And that is the following information structure that I call here or refer to as two-sided pooling, okay? Simply put, we're simply going to flip or we're going to replicate the pool that we created at the top. We're going to replicate that also at the bottom, okay? And, and so you now can see where the incentive constraints come in. What as a advertiser I want to avoid is being bundled because then I really don't know what my value is. If I could somehow get the information of what my value is when I'm in the bundle, I could improve the bit under manual bidding and I could do much better. Well, I can do that by basically um, just completely reversing my preference statement, go in the opposite direction, that is report minus one whenever I have one and conversely. Then I'm essentially ending up in the lower pool when I'm coming from the upper pool. But since I'm again in a pool and I have not uh, my information fully revealed, I'm not gaining any information from this misrepresentation, okay? If there were not a pool, if I had done this misrepresentation, I actually now could use this additional information to refine my bid, okay? Under auto bidding, I don't, I'm not being given that chance, okay? But under manual bidding, I had that chance, but this, a slight modification will remove the incentive to misreport. Now notice, we are creating a pool at the bottom of the distribution. That is typically a valuation that is not going to be winning very often, nor does it going to appear very often in the winning allocation. So as we have sufficiently many bidders, the importance of this segment 
and the loss in efficiency is going to be very, very small. Okay. That means we have first um, a result on honesty and obedience that is even under manual bidding, we can get incentive compatibility. Okay, that's the first result. But more significantly, this, you know, um, more complicated mechanism in some sense, it's more complicated information structure is still strong enough to guarantee incentive compatibility and get us exactly the same revenue in the limit as we get under the optimal information structure. So W2 is now simply the expected value we get under the um, two-sided pool, okay? And that value converges to precisely what we would get under the optimal information structure. So there's a sense in which uh, this information structure or a variant of it works both under automated bidding as well as under manual bidding when the incentive constraints um, are stronger. And I think with this, um, I'm at the end of the time and we can of course discuss many things, but um, why don't I leave that to you, Ozan Baidi? Thank you. Thank you so much, Dirk, for a real nice talk. Um, uh, I know we are a little bit over time, but uh, let's open up uh, for questions. If you have questions, please raise your hand and we'll, um, we'll uh, let you ask the question directly to uh, Dirk. And um, in the meantime, I have a brief question, Dirk, about the mm -hmm. uh, second health. So I do understand that the, um, uh, manual bidding in the manual bidding setting, you, you obtain a limit result uh, that basically says that um, we still have the same type of result as the uh, automated setting for mm -hmm. finite, and there will be some gap. Is there any understanding of uh, you know how bad things are for uh, finite and or how the gap diminishes? Um. Uh, yes, I mean, we have the explicit expressions. I, I don't know what they would give us. Uh, intuitively, the gap is small because it, it, we are creating the inefficiency at the lower end. Um, and so, you know, um, in terms of the distribution, it looks symmetric, but in terms of the actual usage, in terms of the allocation, it's going to be uh, not appear very often because the likelihood that we're going to have the winning bidder and the second highest bidder to be in the lower pool is very small. Yep. So, so I think we can sharpen that result by, by a rate result. Um, I see. Ah, uh, uh -huh. then uses a sort of to advertise a second result, of course, and that's um, we just spoke about a standard auction is where we're guaranteeing that we're selling the object. Let's suppose, um, as uh, as we do in an extension, that we have the right to use a reserve price. Okay. Now, in a reserve price, in some sense, we're doing bundling automatically at the lower end because we're saying you can only participate in the auction if you are getting a value that is exceeding the reserve price okay so in some so so that loss that i gave you here is basically gone immediately once we are using the additional tool of a reserve price Got it. i see So, uh, Vitor, feel free, feel free to unmute yourself. Hello, I have a question that's uh, still about a very uh, um, basic issue. So the construction of the optimal information structure, uh, mm -hmm. how would it change if I were to think about purely disclosure of attributes? Because like, it seems like it relies on the introduction of noise when you're, you know, in the, uh, when you're like revealing information about this underlying. No. Uh, no, not at all. No. So, so I gave you, uh, uh, maybe I went to over this too fast <laughs> or too imprecise. The, there's an exact translation in terms of the attributes. The optimal information structure says that I'm going to tell you the exact number of matched attributes uh, as long as the number of matches is below n star, where the n star is simply the corresponding number to q star. And if you are above that, then I'm simply going to tell you, you have more than N star matches. Okay. Because so, no, so there's no noise whatsoever. Okay. Because in the case of finitely many attributes, so this means that we're basically working with discrete distributions in that mm -hmm. because we seem to be working sometimes with continuous yeah, so 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 the only thing uh, um, so the only thing that happens is that 
so the argument is uh, is completely general. That is whether it's continuous or it is is finite. Uh, the thing that might happen is that um, Q star and N star do not align because of the discreteness completely. In this case, you're going to split one particular, at, in, in this case, you're going to split one attribute uh, into sometimes telling you match, sometimes you're telling you don't match, but that is really, so uh, that's basically something that's going to disappear with any finite number of large attributes. Oh, I see, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. I also have a follow-up question to that mm -hmm. one. So you showed us this nice result that when n goes to infinity, even though like the, the competition is of course there, when j also goes to infinity, there is a still this gap between like a full disclosure of information and what information can achieve. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering, so that gap disappears when j is uh, finite or we kind of even uh, kind no, of no, reverse the order. I'm sorry. Um... Uh, very good. So um, when J is finite, um, I think no distribution can have a heavy tail, right? Right, exactly. So, so, um, so the second result basically was using J infinite. Absolutely, yes. All right. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> I think this may be all the uh, questions. Wonderful. Okay. It's also Friday afternoon and we should uh, enjoy the end of the term. So, um, exactly. Dirk, thank you so much for joining us today and also for an excellent talk. And, and of thank course, you anybody so you know, uh, can send me questions by email if, if there are things that, that I left open or unanswered. Um, Wonderful. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, everyone.